I'm not going to spend much time talking about myself here. Uh, I will say that, like probably many of you, uh, I'm a little low on sleep and focus right now, so bear with me for, for, uh, for that reason. But, um, but I'm excited to talk about this, and I, and I hope, so I've got three goals for this uh, session here. So one is uh, you, if you find it just interesting. I think it's an interesting story and um, hopefully serves as a distraction for everything else going on in the world right now. And then two, as Matt said, I hope you learned something, even if you've been doing this for a while. And then three, I hope you learn a little bit more about kind of how we go about things in Alpha Fellowship and, and what you might learn more if you were to uh, join the course. Um, so uh, I'll start out by asking this question. And I mean, it's rhetorically uh, because we're not doing a back and forth here. But the reason why I ask it is I think it highlights how hard product management is. Because if you ask a whole bunch of different folks who do this for a living, you'll get a whole bunch of different answers. And um, some of that's because the field itself is, is relatively new and, and fast growing. Um, some of it's also because it's highly contextual. So whether you're at a big company, small company, product led company, there's a, whatever domain you might be in, there's a whole bunch of different ways uh, PMs, it, PMing looks like, product management looks like. And so one of the things we do in the course is actually have a bunch of guest lecturers come in and talk about their experiences. So you get that multifaceted view on how it could be different in different environments. Regardless of what you actually do, one of the core things that a lot of high, and, and I think um, <clears throat> uh, like we'll talk about this later in the, in the talk, um, but one of the core things that um, hiring managers look for is what uh, is often called a product mindset. So it's less about specific skills, it's actually more about characteristics that you can build up over time that regardless of the scenario that you're in, these kind of characteristics will help you be a better product manager. Um, and so um, so the skills are important, but as Matt said earlier, um, so are these characteristics, um, and that's a lot of what we're going to focus on in the course. Um, in order to kind of uh, talk through uh, some of how this uh, manifests itself um, when you're doing product management, I thought I'd share a little bit of a quote here. I, I promise this is as close to politics that I'll get <laughs> in this talk um, by mentioning the word press secretary. But um, this quote's by Seth Godin, who's a, a renowned um, marketing thought leader. And um, basically this idea that human beings, we all are walking around as press secretaries where we've got this narrative that we have in our mind, how the, our world works and how we relate to it. And we're constantly trying to find rationale to substantiate that narrative. Um, so I think this is important uh, for a whole bunch of reasons in the world, but from a product management perspective, the reason why this was a really key insight for me is here in hearing this is that regardless of what you do in product management, um, one of the key uh, things to, to, um, to, to practice is thinking like a storyteller, um, understanding the motivations that go into the, all the different people that you interact with in your job. So the obvious one is uh, customers, because um, clearly you want to learn more about what their skills are, or sorry, what their lives look like, what are their pain points, how do they relate to different products in the space, et cetera. So that's an obvious one, both the things that they tell you, but also the things that maybe they don't tell you, right? And the ways they act. Um, but beyond customers, like it's also super important to um, think about the motivations and the stories of the people in your organization. So what is the CEO telling themselves? Like what story are they telling themselves? What story are they telling the investors? How do the different, how do motivations and stories look different amidst the different departments of the company, marketing, product, operations, finance, um, the more, whatever level you're at, at in terms of product, the more you're able to actually understand, empathize with the different folks um, in, around you and their stories, the better you're gonna be able to get things done with those people. Uh, and this especially is true as you get more senior in product because your job is to actually tell a product story uh, and get people to buy into that. And so this is one of the core things I tell people that is, I don't think it's enough attention in terms of a skill set, but uh, is really important. And I'll talk more, a little bit more about that. But the problem with, uh, with storytelling and being a press secretary is that uh, we constantly are looking for things to support our worldview. And so um, that's something called confirmation bias in psychology, where we're always looking for the, the things that support our view. And so in order to combat this storytelling and narrative, we have to actually go act like a scientist. And what I mean by that is uh, set a hypothesis for what we think uh, and then create an experiment that allows us to go test that. So ideally, if you're a really good scientist and product manager, 
you're looking for things that specifically refute uh, that hypothesis um, and validate it. Um, but regardless, finding concrete evidence one way or another, um, the combination of thinking like a storyteller and acting like a scientist, in my mind, are like core skills that go into that product mindset that I was uh, talking about. And so um, I'm actually going to show you some of that um, with this case study that we're going to walk through here, where um, where we use those, where I use those skills and my team use those skills. And so I'm going to tell you about Relay Foods, uh, which um, was a really interesting company that sadly no longer is around, um, but uh, was in the online grocery space. And I could give you uh, like a ton of <laughs> different stories about Relay Foods, but um, I'm going to mainly focus on a little bit of context setting and then going to um, just dive into the case uh, part of it. So one second here. Um, and so, um, so Relay Foods, uh, one of the interesting things, uh, the more you work in startups, the more you learn is that companies and products change quite a bit over the course of the, uh, their existence. And that was definitely the case with Relay. So we started out just basically saying, hey, we'll deliver anything to your door, <laughs> not even food specific whatsoever. We then moved into food specific stuff, uh, more, like, more like Instacart. So we'll go to these different grocery stores for you and bring them to your house. Um, in retrospect, that probably was the better call <laughs> for the direction that, uh, given how successful they are these days. Um, but we really found our niche in, um, because we were in the mid-Atlantic region in the US and um, there's lots of great local farms and organic type uh, mentality here. And so we, we wanted to be the whole foods market in terms of brand feel, in terms of focus, but with the convenience, both in terms of shopping, online shopping plus delivery of Amazon. Um, and so that's really what we're aiming for. Um, here's uh, an image I dug up of uh, just like our home screen at the time. Now, this is, I think, six or seven years ago at this point. So it's been a little while. Um, and the thing that was really neat was that we had seemed to really struck a chord around that time. Uh, so net promoter score is basically a way of saying how much do, how much does a given user, how likely are they to recommend this product or service to a friend? Now, one of the things we'll talk about in the course is um, this particular score, this particular um, approach, um, there's debate in the product management community as to how much you should rely on this score. But generally, this, like the higher the better, and this particular score um, is, is particularly high. Uh, and so we, we had struck upon something that people seem to really like. And, but we probably wouldn't be doing this case study if uh, everything was like great. Like there clearly was a problem. And so I'm gonna talk now about how we address that problem. And so that problem, um, although we had lots of problems, um, uh, like it's, it's hard being a startup generally, but our core problem was around retention, which is basically um, what percentage of people are we keeping around after the first order and that they continue to order with us. And you're probably looking at these numbers and saying, oh my gosh, that looks horrible. Uh, and I, I can tell you that, yes, it looks that way. Unfortunately for product managers, these numbers aren't actually out of the ordinary in an e-commerce setting. Um, now they should be a lot higher in a subscription setting, um, uh, which is why a lot of companies are moving to subscription services. But um, for e-commerce, they're not terrible. Now, and that's partly because you may order like a TV every once in a while or a lawnmower or wh whatever it is, you don't need to buy every single week from most companies. The issue for us was that you like, you kind of do with groceries. That's one of the few products out there that you actually do buy every week and buy a decent amount every week. And so the fact that we were having a whole bunch of people trying us, but not sticking around was clearly a problem because they were like, they clearly had to go buy food somewhere the next week. And they weren't doing that by and large at Relay. Um, and so to kind of drive that home here with um, customer economics, uh, we for those first time first time customers, their average order size was about sixty dollars. So that's how much groceries they were buying the, in the first order from us. But it took it cost us upwards of ninety dollars to actually acquire them, meaning that the advertising that went to, to try to get them to come in the door, the coupons that we gave, a whole bunch of other things around that um, was almost double the cost. So you can imagine that the more you are uh, spending um, and having lots of folks not come around for a second order, uh, like the worse off that we were as a company. Now, that, sh that should make sense intuitively. What's interesting is that 
Um, one of the things that you should learn early in your career is that every business and every industry has its own like dynamics of how usage and uh, of the product influences the business KPIs. So uh, this is customer lifetime value, which is basically a projection of for a given user, how much, much how many dollars do we think they're going to spend over the course of the next year? Let's call it year here. Um, so this number, even though we had most of the people at Relay not coming back for a second order, um, this is actually still fairly high. Um, and the reason was, even if you only have a small percentage of people that are actually ordering, uh, like past that first order, if they order every week for 52 weeks and they spend $100 plus on groceries every week, your average uh, customer lifetime value number is gonna be uh, still not bad, even if um, the median is, is not great. And um, so this number actually wasn't that bad in the abstract for us. The, the challenge was that our business was super expensive to run. And so we had warehouses and inventory and trucks going around delivering to people. And so um, even though this was a decently high number in some respects, um, it wasn't high enough for us to have a sustainable business. And so we really had to go target, how do we get this new customer CLV number higher? Um, and like, the core part of the problem here seemed to be, we had a lot of people saying that like, hey, I love this thing. You sh other people, you should try this out. Like, uh, why were they doing that? But at the same time, most of them not using, continuing to use it themselves. And so this is where that like, kind of think like a storyteller element comes in, which is to say that like really trying to put yourself into those shoes and understand how that could be the case. And so we went and talked to customers and tried to gauge what was going on. And one of the key things that we learned was that um, the, the set of problems around grocery shopping isn't just the convenience of delivery. It was about how do I go about figuring out what to make in a given week in terms of recipes, in terms of health, in terms of how to make something that's easy to cook. And so the problem was actually this broader mental energy around the full grocery life cycle, not just the convenience of online. And uh, and so um, what would happen is that they would have their first order with us, they would like it, but they wouldn't, it wouldn't solve their problem well enough where it would keep them from going back to their normal routine of grocery shopping at the grocery store each week. So we coupled that story kind of telling element with this acting like a scientist piece, which is to say that we crafted a hypothesis. So we said, <clears throat> by incorporating more elements of the full grocery life cycle, we think that these new customers will become more sticky because we're solving their problem that much better. And thus that new customer lifetime value number that I showed you before should be higher and the retention number should be higher as a result. So, um, so this is what we did. We, we created a low cost experiment. Um, one of the things that I think is hard to recognize if you're not working in product and organization is how hard it is to get prioritization for an idea that you have. Even if you, if it's a great idea, customers say they want it, there's lots of great ideas in, comp in, in companies and there's lots of people with, with opinions. And so um, often case, oftentimes you can't just have an idea that seems cool. You actually have to go prove it somehow concretely first before you go get the prioritization around some big project around for it. So for us, what we did was we, we did a lot of manual work to create uh, blog post articles that had a bunch of uh, links already built into it around meal planning and constructing an order. And um, our goal was to drive traffic to that in order to, show, to, in order to see whether or not people were going to engage with this content, which was he very heavily meal uh, planning and cooking focused more than people who weren't coming in through that way. Um, and lo and behold, even though we didn't have great uh, instrumentation from an analytics perspective, we did see some concrete evidence that, hey, there's something here. This seems to be working. And so we took that, so the quantitative evidence, and we combined that with the um, qualitative evidence. So we actually got some testimonials from customers who engaged with those blog posts. Um, again, we haven't done any engineering time yet here. Uh, all we've done is um, some good content and some like manual work around making connections and things like that. Um, and so we were able to bring that to the leadership team and say, hey, we have a good idea and we have some evidence that this thing might work. So can we get more funding and time to go work on a bigger project to showcase that? And 
Um, lo and behold, we did. And that was exciting. And so this process, like this little mini project in order to go get the prioritization um, was something that is something that I think is worth thinking about in any setting that you're in, in a product management co context is, is there anything I can do without a whole bunch of engineering or otherwise time in order to showcase that there's something here in order to get that prioritization? So enter the meal planning project. So, <clears throat> so basically uh, this was our project to go solve that problem that we talked about before. And I'm gonna, <laughs> gonna give you the blow by blow in terms of how this went. Um, but uh, I certainly could, but uh, I'm just gonna focus primarily on the lessons learned, like in terms of what went well, and then also the lessons learned in terms of what I think stunted further growth. So one thing we did well is we just, we did this act of product discovery, which is basically just a way of saying we did research. So we talked to customers, we put together alternatives of how we could approach the problem. We prioritized work. We didn't just jump into solving the problem, um, like which honestly I see a ton um, in my consulting work. And so the fact that we actually stopped and thought hard and did work before doing the work was really important. And so uh, there's a whole bunch of different frameworks for doing product discovery. Uh, the, here are some right here. Uh, we talk about in the class uh, which ones and why, but honestly, the bigger deal is that you just do it <laughs> somehow. Uh, and partly because it helps you collate all this disparate information of uh, what you might do and why into a strategic decision-making framework. Um, but then two, it also just stops you from skipping steps as often. Uh, and both of those things are really important. And so um, this is something that all too often gets skipped and definitely shouldn't. Uh, the other thing we did, which is part of that, was we talked to our customers, which seems like a pretty novel thing. <laughs> uh, shouldn't be such a novel thing, I should say. Um, and so there are two types of, uh, or there's probably more, but there's at least two types of um, ways to talk to customers in terms of what you're hoping to learn. One's attitudinal, which basically is like, hey, tell me about like your problems. Tell me like uh, about your workflows. Tell me about your feelings. Just give me a general sense of what the problem is. And um, so that you, that you as the product manager can better understand what's going on. You do that first before you put the something in front of them and say, hey, I want you to react to this uh, because you want to understand the abstract first what their problem is before like you skew their like their reaction with something specific. So but then you put something specific in front of them and, and let them play with it. So it's pricing. It could be a UI, could be a whole sorts of things. But um, by actually seeing them use something concrete tells you a whole heck of a lot more about how they react to whatever thing you go build um, ultimately. Um, related to that is that we prototyped before we built. Um, so this is a tool called uh, a wireframing tool called Balsamic. There's a whole bunch of great uh, other tools out there that allow you to do the same thing or similar things like Figma or Sketch or some other things. Um, but uh, Envision being another one. Uh, but the general idea is that it's relatively easy to create these views that get at the concrete elements of what you're building. Um, and allow people to react to it without having to have built stuff already, which is very expensive and time consuming. Uh, this thing also is something that you would think wouldn't be so novel, but unfortunately is not the norm in uh, a lot of companies that I've been a part of, which is that uh, the typical way in which projects get done is um, like one team starts with it and hands it off to another team, which hands it off to another team. And you've got this back and forth and you end up with a delay, lots of delays and kind of a mess at the end. Um, and by actually having these teams move together, move together on this project uh, allowed us to create a much more cohesive whole at the end of it and also look to actually launch it on time. Uh, again, this is something that shouldn't be a surprise for many of you out there. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in a minute. But um, the act of acting or of releasing something iteratively allows you to maximize your learning. So you release something, you learn from it. You release something else, you learn from it. Um, a lot of companies uh, do a bunch of work and then release it at the end and kind of hope it all worked out. Uh, and most of the time, it <laughs> unfortunately does not. Uh, and so these are some of the things, again, while not like uh, brilliant insights are really important. And we're gonna dig into that, like the nuances of that, like in the course of what exactly goes into each of these things. But um, it gets all these things get skipped so often, and it's unfortunate because they have a huge impact on the success of projects. 
Um, so this is a, a, a chart that kind of gets at some of that uh, sort of iterative rollout, uh, which, and this is a growing, po a popular sort of approach uh, to how to release things these days, which is um, the, on the y-axis is the percent of customers who have access to the feature at a given time. So you can see that in the beginning, when you're just researching and building, very few people have access to this new feature that you're building. Um, and then you slowly uh, wide, broaden the list of people who have access to it as you iterate and get more confidence in what you're building and that it's the right thing. So that at the end, um, when you release it to the rest of the people, rest of the public, um, it's not this giant lever that you're pulling and being like, well, I hope this works. Uh, and, and it's much more of a, hey, we already have a pretty good sense that this thing is gonna work. And now we're just giving access to a broader um, set of users. And so, oh, one second. Um, <clears throat> And so at the end of that uh, process in that launch in March of 2015, so again, this is a while back, uh, we landed with uh, something we called meal planning. And uh, there's a whole bunch I could tell you about the solution of meal planning. Um, uh, this blog post I re reference here actually goes through more of that if you're interested. But the, the crux of it was that we landed on a, a solution that actually took customer workflows into account. A lot of online grocery stores just throw recipes up onto a page and just kind of hope it works out. Um, whereas we actually incorporated a lot of interesting elements. So for example, um, you, as a family, you could set what your number of people in your family, you could set your diet, your allergens. Uh, you could, uh, one neat thing we did was um, the recipes we recommended to you actually took into account what you already had in your order. So if you already had eggs in your order, we would recommend you recipes that used up those eggs. And um, there are lots of things that we did and we were really proud of what we launched at the time, um, but it was because we actually went through that product discovery step and didn't just try throwing something up there that we, that we thought might work, but weren't sure about. So this is the part where I'm uh, supposed to tell you that uh, we, we doubled our, our, our CLV uh, because of this amazing solution that we came up with. Um, but the, the story isn't so simple. Um, we actually didn't know when we launched it, um, what the result was. Uh, and what I mean by that is that we hadn't set up the analytics instrumentation or uh, to be able to confidently say, how has behavior changed as a result of this? We were so focused on just the building that we had left off the measuring. And so we got to this point of launching it, which we were excited about. People were giving us great feedback. But we couldn't tell like the leadership team or others what actually that looked like quantitatively. And so this is the biggest learning that I had at Relay Foods, um, which is that a lot of times when you're in that mode of just building, you leave the instrumentation and the analysis side of stuff till the end because you'll get back to that because it doesn't seem as important. When in the reality is having a shared semblance of what success looks like. Hey, what is, is this going to be, if we hit X, is that going to be good? If we hit Y, is that going to be good? And then being able to choose the metrics and build them into the product usage uh, is critical for like actually understanding what just happened <laughs> and how do you move forward from that? Be, and the, the part of the reason why that's so important is most, pro most companies work this way, which is that they have a, a roadmap or a Gantt chart or whatever that says, oh, looks like meal planning's done. Time to go work on X, Y, and Z now. And so we were at the tail end of this meal planning bar here, and we were saying, hey, there looks like this is something really exciting. We really just need some time to go instrument it and iterate on it a little bit more. And, um, but there were all these people around us who were saying, but we already said we we're going to do X, Y, and Z. And so we, we didn't have the bandwidth to go, um, to go back and do those things that we should have done. And so the second lesson I learned, um, which is like comes out of that, is that um, companies have to have some sort of framework for adapting. Uh, I, 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 like, all too often, uh, companies get this really rigid sense of how the world is going to look like going forward. And so they create these beautiful Gantt charts um, and so what happens is that when you get some information, hey, this thing launched and this is how it's doing, um, there's this he real hesitancy to changing anything with the plans that you already set out. And so if you have a framework as a company or as a product team for saying, hey, this is when we fold, this is when we call and keep going, this is when we really double down on it, it allows you to take in that new information and say, 
oh, wow, there's something really here. I know we thought this other thing was going to be important, but this seems like the most important thing right now. And um, again, this is something that in a product management setting, being able to have this conversation uh, like is, is critical to um, being able to adapt. And relatedly, the third lesson that I'd share here is I was, I and other people around me were so heads down on um, like just building this thing that we failed to take into account the, that kind of storytelling element the motivations of the people around us. Um, because a lot of those, a lot of the folks in the rest of the organization, not that there was nefar nefarious or anything like that, but they were waiting for projects X, Y, and Z. And those were gonna be the things that helped them build their metrics or the things that they thought that the company needed. And so if, if I had done a better job in my product role of saying, um, hey, what are you, how are you thinking about things? And really staying in touch with people and their stories, I would have done, been able to better come up with a solution for how we were gonna to meld together the competing priorities when the time came. Um, and so that's something that I learned at the time and I've been able to take with me since then. Uh, it's also an indicator of why experience is so important um, in, in product management is just because this is really hard to, in the abstract, learn. Uh, and so um, this is something we'll talk about in the class with like a really heavy training component. How do you do some of these things? So fast forward, I'm not going uh, to sort of ignore the CLV thing, which is it wasn't a clickbait to get you to come to this, uh, <laughs> to come to this session. So fast forward four months later. We had finally, um, uh, we had finally got it like through some of that backlog. We had finally done some instrumentation on the on the analytics side. We had finally put some time into having analysts put up put together a report, and lo and behold, the results were pretty awesome. And uh, I'm going to get to new customers in a second, which is the focus here. But um, but basically, for existing customers, um, their numbers went up uh, as well. And this is an opt-in feature. Uh, not something that were forced upon them. And a lot of them tried it and a lot of them changed their behavior as a result of that. Um, then Labs customers, so these are customers that we had a while ago, but haven't, we haven't seen them in a while. They also came back a lot more frequently than we were used to seeing, or a lot, a lot more of them than we were used to seeing. And their numbers went up as well, including this key one, which is that um, about a third of them stayed active after coming back, which folks in marketing will tell you like with winbacks, is not all that that's not all together uh that's not uh, very usual usually you win back somebody by giving them a coupon and then they go and leave again but the best findings were for new customers which has been the focus of this chat which is that we had uh, those the customers who are coming in for this through this new meal planning feature versus the customers that weren't the customers that were um, we're ordering significant, having significantly higher orders, both in that first order and beyond. And this key thing around retention, they were sticking around a lot more, um, a, a lot more often, both of which are huge, right? So if you order more and you stick around more, that together is what gets us to the 2x uh, number. That's uh, one of the reasons why y'all are joining. Uh, and so uh, this is where having that st like storytelling, hypothesis setting around what we thought was going to happen and what we needed to do. This is a clear example of not, and it wasn't just product, the, the product team, but it was very much product led in terms of doing the product uh, discovery and the product execution of how do we better solve this problem for customers by giving them a broader solution to their grocery problem. Uh, so we were super jazzed at the time uh, and uh, I really, really, really wish that um, the story <laughs> ended differently um, because we were, we were, we, we had it. We were like, oh, this is the answer. We just have to go do and invest more into that. Um, unfortunately, the cliche is so true, which is timing is everything. Um, so we, by that time, we were running out of money as a company uh, because it was so expensive, and um, we ended up getting stuck in this whirlwind of um, fundraising, mergers, and acquisitions. Um, a lot of the focus, both specifically of the leadership team who is like, and the product team who are doing prioritization type work, but also the whole company of like uh, really trying to focus on like what we were doing from a fundraising perspective and not what we were doing from a product perspective. And so in retrospect, if we had better instrumentation of how well this thing was actually got, we working out of the gate um, and we didn't have to wait four months to get that information, we would have had four more months of been able to double down and um, add more and 
been that much stronger going into a fundraising round. So lo and behold, we actually got acquired by another company called Door-to-Door -Door Organics in May of 2016. Um, and, um, and generally, like, I think, uh, hey, it was an exit. People, uh, so that, par that part of it was exciting. It wasn't the exit that we had hoped for, um, uh, but it was an exit. Uh, and um, what we did from May 2016 forward is that we worked on incorporating a lot of these elements that I just showed into the Door to Door Organics platform. And the neat thing was that through a lot of hard work, um, both from the Relay folks coming aboard, but also from really awesome folks that were already at Door to Door Organics, um, we were starting to see a lot of the same engagement and exciting numbers just as <laughs> timing is everything one more time it came along. Uh, remember that uh, deck that I, or sorry, like the slide I showed you earlier where we were aiming to be Whole Foods plus Amazon. Well, turns out that just around this time, Amazon bought Whole Foods. And so Amazon became the Amazon plus Whole Foods. And even though we had an amazing product, people were excited, um, the fundraising uh, in that space just froze up entirely because everyone was fearful of what that meant. And so no one wanted to spend until like in investor dollars until they understood better what was going to happen with that um, acquisition. So really unfortunate timing for us uh, because that was the end of our chapter. And, um, and so it tells you, even though you can have an amazing product and we had a really good marketing and all sorts of other things, uh, it's not just about that. Uh, it's, it's about a broader set of things um, in, in the market. Uh, the silver lining here is actually that um, even though the company no longer exists, um, it did sell the, the, the product and technology assets. Um, and that's actually being used in a number of different places in the world right now, which is kind of neat. Not in the, it's not definitely not the original way we had envisioned it, but um, it's still a much better chapter, a much better ending than it entirely going away. So that's my story uh, of product-led uh, sort of product-led CLV impact. Um, so I hope you enjoyed it. It was a little bit of a whirlwind there, but I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I'm going to introduce Morgan here, um, who uh, Morgan Kelly, who uh, is a senior product manager at StubHub. As Matt said at the very beginning, um, she she and uh, and StubHub are sponsoring a, a project as part of Alpha Fellowship with the students, so they're going to be able to work on something really concrete. So she's going to talk a little bit about that, a little bit about her reaction to these slides, um, and a little bit about tips for aspiring product managers out there. And then I'll circle back in a Q&A at the end here to talk a little bit more as well. So thank you all for listening. And uh, Morgan, the floor is yours. Hey, can you guys hear me all right? Yes. Yep, definitely. Cool. Um, so I apologize ahead of time. I have a seven-week-old puppy in my lap, and she was sleeping, and now she's awake. So if she makes noise, I apologize for her. Um, so thanks for sharing that case, Jeff. That was um, really interesting to hear about it from your perspective. Um, what I really liked that you did was you started with data and you ended with data. And you talked about how like the pitfall of, of what you guys did was that you didn't have the data to end the story in the beginning. Um, so that was really interesting. And I too have fallen into that trap of like, let's just get it done and get it out and then we'll measure it later. Um, and have seen have seen the pitfalls of that as well. So I think that's definitely a key learning that everyone should keep in mind. Um, the other thing that I really liked about the case was the emphasis on the user research. It's really easy for companies to you know take feedback or people calling in from customer service and listen to what those people are saying, but you really get those key insights from those um, ethnographic interviews or like, you know, asking people about their their motivations and their mindset while they're going through something um, and then seeing what their pain points actually are in order to better solve those. Um, so that was very, very interesting. Thank you. Um, and we can go to the next slide. I can talk about um, uh, tips for aspiring product managers. So I um, out of business school switched into product management. So I'm very familiar with, um, you know, how you sort of tell a story about yourself in a way that um, shows your value as a product manager. Um, so I have some tips that uh, people could keep in mind. So first is actually tailor your story. Like think like a storyteller as a product manager, but think about yourself as the product here. Um, think about the hiring manager as having, you know, a pain point that they need to solve and, and you fit into that, uh, you are that solution. Um, so instead of like, oh, I really want to be a product manager here, say like, you know, I have this skill set, I've come from this industry, and I've solved this problem. 
uh, and I really think I'd be an asset. Um, next one. Uh, the, the main thing for me when I'm interviewing product managers or aspiring product managers is their ability to show or demonstrate customer empathy throughout either their education or their career. Um, so this is really hard to teach and it's a very key skill of a product manager. Your customer can be internal, external, um, you name it. So how can you frame something that you've done throughout your career or in school or decide project um, to show that you were thinking about it from a customer point of view? Um, the example that I have for my career is I didn't have a product management role at the time. I actually was uh, redoing the global onboarding program for a, for a energy efficiency company and no one had done it from the new hire perspective. So I put myself in the customer's shoes, which was the new hire. Uh, and I was like, okay, what information would I want to hear first? Uh, what, what makes the most sense to learn about the company instead of just from the company's perspective, what do we want to make sure the new hires know? Um, and that was successful and I measured it and all of those good things. Uh, so I was able to talk to that and talk about that um, in interviews and uh, be able to show that I could be a good product manager uh, with the um, chance. Next one. And then lastly, obviously practice makes perfect. Um, think about as you're going through your own life, think about things that you like about products that you use every day. Think about things that you don't like. Uh, something to pay attention to is when you have an emotion about a product or about something you're doing, either annoyance or surprise. That's really a time when you want to focus in on what you're surprised about, what you're annoyed about, how you would fix it, or maybe what decision was made to create that. And if that annoyance was on purpose, maybe uh, what the product manager might have been thinking when they uh, created that that product or that um, that situation for you. And I will hand it back to Jeff for the Q&A. Great. Thank you, Morgan. That was great.